Goedemiddag en welkom allemaal. Bienvenue à tous et à toutes uh, à cet après-midi de conférence et d'atelier. Good afternoon, everybody. We're very happy that our topic is, uh, has so many, so many interests. Dat het internationaal kapitaal de woning heeft ontdekt als een veilig beleggingsobject is helemaal geen nieuws meer. Het is hoog tijd dus om samen te brainstormen hoe de grond van de markt gehaald kan worden om de speculatie een halt toe te roepen. Sortir des terrains du marché pour rendre la ville accessible est le sujet qui nous réunit aujourd'hui. Les Community Land Trust le font euh, déjà dans plusieurs villes dans le monde entier. Et aujourd'hui, on va refléter ensemble pour voir comment le modèle CLT peut être mis à l'échelle et quel est le pot potentiel pour Bruxelles. Um, before entering in the heart of the debate, uh, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Sophie Hieselen. I'm part of the staff of Community Land Trust Brussels. And the event of today, today is actually just one part of a big event uh, that takes place today and tomorrow because, because we have different things to celebrate. Uh, to this year is our 10th uh, anniversary. Um, today is also the World CLT Day. So everywhere, everywhere on the world, people are celebrating uh, the Community Land Trust movement. Tomorrow, we will have the inauguration of one of our buildings in Molenbeek uh, that reunites 21 housing units. It's in the Rue de l'Independence. You're very welcome in the afternoon to celebrate with us. And also, tomorrow evening, we are receiving the World Habitat Awards we won uh, last year. Meer info over het grote feest vinden jullie op de affiches en op onze website. Uh, voor het evenement van vandaag hebben wij samengewerkt met verschillende organisaties uh, die ik langs deze weg dan ook wil bedanken. Uh, het gaat over Perspectief Brussels die ons hier ontvangt, World Habitat, de onderzoeksgroep Cosmopolis van de VUB, Brussels Center for Urban Studies, SohoNet, Center for CLT Innovation en Brussels Academy. Ce sont les partenaires avec qui on a organisé cet événement aujourd'hui et j'en profite déjà pour euh, les remercier vivement pour euh, cette très chouette collaboration. Alors, le programme d'aujourd'hui va se dérouler essentiellement en français et en anglais. Il y a des traductions simultanées qui sont prévues. Euh, ceux qui en ont besoin ont reçu un petit euh, écouteur et une petite machine. La fr le français, c'est le canal 1. L'anglais, c'est le canal 2. Et dans la première partie de cet après-midi, on va accueillir quatre euh, personnes internationaux et deux invités belges qui vont euh, partager avec nous leur expérience. Malheureusement, on n'a pas prévu de questions-réponses en plénière, mais on aura une demi-heure de pause où vous pourriez tout de suite vous adresser à nos invités pour poser toutes vos questions. Et après la pause, à 16h30, on va faire un grand brainstorming dans quatre groupes que je vais introduire euh, tout à l'heure. Et donc, on va se répartir euh, dans différents espaces de ce bâtiment pour... Euh, échanger ensemble sur les sujets concernés. Et tout à la fin, il y aura un petit drink qui est offert par Perspective Brussels dans cette salle-ci. Alors, pour la première présentation de la journée, j'aimerais bien inviter David Ireland sur scène. Je pense que je vais pouvoir le dire pour la plupart des intervenants de cet après-midi. David, il a un très long parcours d'activiste euh, il a lutté contre les logements vides, le sans-abrisme et plein d'autres sujets en lien avec le logement, dans le Royaume-Uni essentiellement. Et depuis 2014, David a rejoint l'équipe de World Habitat, Award, euh, World Habitat pardon, en tant que directeur général. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sophie. And um, good afternoon, everybody. And I should say, um, happy CLT Day. 
Um, and also, congratulations um, on, on happy birthday to Seal TB. Um, my name's David Ireland. I'm, I'm the chief executive of World Habitat. Um, and one of the things we do is, is um, run a competition called the World Habitat Awards, which um, Seal TB um, very proud to say are uh, the current current holders of. Um, we'll be presenting the trophy tomorrow, if, uh, if any of you are going to be av available um, for, the, for the event to, to tomorrow. Um, so th the, the story I really wanted to, to start with was, was a bit of a sort of circular one, really, because um, the, 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 the history of the World Habitat Awards um, goes back a, a, few, a few years about 35 years, in fact. Um, and one of those, one of those previous um, award winners um, back in 2007 um, was um, the Champlain Housing Trust. And you'll be hearing from Brenda very shortly. Um, and this, um, this photograph, you may, you may recognize some of the people. Actually, some of the people are, some of the people are here. <laughs> um, and looking very fresh-faced in this photograph. Um, but this, um, this photograph was taken um, on a visit which, um, which we funded um, and Champlain Housing Trust organized um, to go and see the work of that remarkable um, community land trust. Um, it um, is one of the pioneers of, of the CLT movement, um, one of the biggest CLTs, um, and also one of, one of the most inspirational and, and most influential. Um, and several, some of the people there who, who you may recognize um, on that visit were inspired um, and, um, and came back um, and, and on, on the basis of what they'd learned, set up the idea for um, CLT um, Brussels. Um, and it's, it's a sort of fantastic, fantastic achievement that, uh, that uh, just over a decade later, um, they were in the position that um, Champlain were as a, as a winner um, of, of, the, of, the, of the awards. Um, I always think that, um, that, that, that CLTs are, are an important part of what we're about. Um, the, the idea of the awards is to find um, the best housing ideas from around the world and take them to the people who need them most. Um, and um, there are many things that we award um, to do with all different aspects um, of, of, of housing. Um, but we keep coming back to, to CLTs um, because I think they are one of the big ideas. They're one of the great housing ideas, one of the big ideas, um, I would say, of the 20th century. Um, some people will know the history far better than me, but um, there's the, the, the history of the, 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 the um, movement goes back, I think, to the late 1960s, when the first CLTs um, um, came, in, came into being. Um, but I'd argue, actually, the principles of it go back much, much further and much, much deeper. Um, I was um, sort of reading something by the great architect Walter Siegel um, a few weeks ago, um, who said that 99% uh, of all the houses ever built were self-built. Um, and it's one of those statements which the more you think about it, the more true it actually sounds. Um, because if you think about the houses that are built here, most of them are not like ones that are in Champlain or Brussels, but um, the majority of houses that are built are actually informal houses um, in favelas, in informal settlements, um, many more made in vernacular style in rural places um, in, in um, remote parts of the world. And even in Europe and North America, until relatively recently, most houses were actually built by the people who ended up living in them maybe assisted with people from the community with, with um, particular skills and experience. Um, and many of those houses too were built on, um, on communal land and many of the people were helped out by their community um, in building those houses. So those kind of principles actually go back far, far further and deep into, uh, I think, our, sort of our DNA as a species and how we, how we house ourselves. So in many ways, it's actually the de development model and the profit model, which is the new thing, um, and, um, and CLTs actually draw on something sort of far, far deeper, I think, um, in, in who we are as a, as a species. And I think that is one of the reasons that they, they work so well. Um, I think an, another sort of symmetry from back in sort of 2007 and 2008 at the time of this photograph was at that time, of course, the world was, was it on the, 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 the brink of a, um, an economic um, crisis, um, as it happens, caused by, um, by the housing business trying to, trying to force mortgages on people that they, they couldn't afford. Um, and today there are many deep economic problems and, and looking into the future, there's some ominous ones coming up. 
Um, and it's not just economic problems. There's, there's a, 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 a climate crisis um, unfolding. Um, and I would argue there's also a political crisis, of, a crisis of, of, of democracy um, coming. So there's, the problems are always there, but um, there's, it's in that context, in that, 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 those, problem, prob those, those, those um, difficult years back in sort of 2008, nine, that, that actually many CLTs got off the ground and started and have flourished over that time. So although there are challenges and difficulties at the moment, um, it's often the small organizations and the new organizations and the ones with the innovation and the ones with, with, with ideas that actually can flourish in, in times of problems. Um, and it's the, it's the larger, um, more monolithic organizations which can, which can struggle. Um, I think it's that quality that, that CLTs have of, of adaptability um, which, which makes them so successful. And I just want to finish with a few just examples of some of the fantastic CLTs that we have seen um, in, in the awards over the years and the different problems that they um, actually solve. Um, this is Canopy. Um, they, they are in Leeds in the United Kingdom. Um, and it's ostensibly a homelessness charity. It's also a community land trust. Um, it trains homeless people and, um, and unemployed people um, with building skills so that, that they can renovate empty houses. Um, and those empty houses go on to provide homes for those people and other vulnerable people um, in their community. And it was an award winner um, back, in fact, on the, uh, I think 2013. You're going to hear from a lot more of this at the moment, so, so I won't talk, talk too much about it. But Canyon Martin Peña, I think one of the most important community land trusts that we have seen, um, taking the idea to a much greater scale um, than we'd, we'd seen before and solving huge problems of social inequality and environmental um, degradation. And I will, Mariela will, will talk to you more in a moment, but one of the ones that inspired me the most. Um, this is um, Granby Four Streets um, in Liverpool. Um, and the house on the left is one of hundreds which were like that. I remember um, walking around Liverpool and seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of houses which were all boarded up um, and were destined for demolition. demolition. Um, Granby Four Streets has become a, a renovation um, community land trust. Um, and what I just loved was one house which was in such poor condition that it was unfeasible to re re repair it as a house. They turned into what they called a winter garden, so put a glass roof over the top, um, and it's become a, a common house um, for, the, um, for, for the community. Um, Lilac in, in Leeds, another one in the UK, um, which has is, which is used the, the community land trust to bring um, standards for environmental um, protection um, to, to a much higher standard and, and, and got a, a community going there to really raise the standards um, in Leeds. Um, and finally, a couple, a couple that we are working on to, 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 um, to try and help um, develop. Um, you may have seen the, 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 the um, growing movement of CLTs in Rio de Janeiro, um, one that we're working to help um, develop and bring on as a way of regularizing informal settlements um, in the favelas in Rio. Um, and finally, one in Bangladesh, um, which, is, which is working to um, create permanent homes um, out of, um, for people in a, the, the Bihari community and a refugee camp in Bangladesh. So I think just a flavor there of some of the many, many things that CLTs can do and how they can solve so many problems and how they can actually thrive um, in circumstances where others cannot. Um, and what I was really heartened to hear this morning um, was that um, in the time since the CLTB um, started, the first CLT in, um, in Europe, there are now 200 which are growing um, and, um, and, 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 and moving on in Europe. So I look forward to coming back in 10 years' time, if I haven't retired by then, um, to award another trophy to one of those 200 or maybe more which have moved the mo movement even further on than, than has been already. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, na deze toelichting van de CLT's in de wereld gaan we ons toespitsen op de CLT in Brussel. Ik vraag graag aan mijn collega Thibaut uh, en coördinator om naar voren te komen. Uh, Thibaut Leroy, 
après quelques années comme conseiller de crédit euh, chez Credal, une coopérative de finances éthiques avec qui on collabore également. Thibault a rejoint l'équipe euh, du CLTB en 2004, euh, 2013 pardon, et c'est notre tête pensante juridique et financier qui va vous présenter aujourd'hui euh, un peu plus en détail le CLT de Bruxelles. Thibault. CLT en um, Brussels, plus uh, spécifiquement. Thank you. My name is Thibault Leroy. I'm one of the two coordinators of CLT Brussels, and today I would like to see what kind of limit CLT should set itself when it comes to produce affordable housing. I speak slowly. That's my, my problem. I try to slow down. So proposing affordable housing is the first and for foremost um, task and mandate of CLT Brussels. We make sure that the housing we offer is affordable for the first buyer. And we also make sure that sale after sale or resale, uh, the uh, accommodation remains affordable so that uh, in 100 years from now, the uh, low income families still have access to affordable housing. Housing. So we developed more than 100 uh, accommodation units uh, without which many families would not have access to ownership. Just to give you an idea of uh, the people who live in all CLT accommodations were eligible to social housing, more than 85% of them were eligible to um, integration income, so it means that they had the lowest possible income, and 75% of them were people who had just arrived in Belgium. So we developed several housing projects. I will show you some of them to give you an idea of what we do. So this is a pilot project in Anderlecht seven uh, units, seven flats. Another one is uh, Rue van der Perubom, this is the rainbow uh, project. The Calico project in another area of Brussels, where there are 34 uh, housing units and uh, five equipments for the people of the district. And the uh, project Indépendance, which is in Molenbeek, and as Sophie told you, this is a project that will be unveiled tomorrow. Uh, the inhabitants were uh, given the keys of their uh, flats a couple of months ago, and so we will have a big party to celebrate that. One of the most interesting aspects of uh, CLT B is the C, C for community. We are highly interested in the work that is performed by CLT across the world about communities. Our role is precisely to train, to uh, strengthen and to help inhabitants become autonomous. So we have a training for and with the inhabitants. We have different types of workshop, workshops uh, uh, for single parent families, uh, namely. We believe that strengthening uh, individual capacity is absolutely key. And so many inhabitants are involved in the board, in the General Assembly. So when uh, we uh, have to choose architects a project in as part of Archilab. To achieve all this, we have lots of uh, partner organizations. Some of them are present here today, others not. And we are present on the ground for all low income people in Brussels. Next to those NGOs or cooperatives, which were at the basis of the CLT Brussels movement, we also uh, cooperate with all institutional actors. We managed to develop uh, uh, very strong collaboration links as well as synergies. You see here all the institutional partners with whom we work. Uh, there are uh, various uh, actors that can promote uh, low, um, uh, low rate uh, accommodation. On a city dev uh, uh, ground, for instance, we are currently developing a housing project together with the Fonds du Logement and the Molenbeek uh, Barrow. We are developing the Independence project. 
We also provide uh, various workshops to inform our uh, uh, target groups about the various uh, housing issues. And in the coming years, we should have another project in Anderlecht and the Calico project, which I show here. That's the one in Excel. So all these are boroughs of Brussels. So uh, CLTB has been supported by uh, the Brussels authorities for 10 years now. Um, it was a pioneer relationship. These uh, relationships get uh, stronger and better with time. So we have an agreement that has been issued to us by the region. And we also will have a management contract that will enable uh, fix the commitments from both CLTB and from the Brussels authorities vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other. We know that the local authorities also listen carefully to what we say. We think that CLTB could be an excellent tool to reconcile two important issues for Brussels. On the one hand, the refurbishment of a low-performance building and um, the low purchasing power of uh, uh, some inhabitants who cannot uh, pay for re rehabilitation. The aim in the short run was to develop housing for 1,000 people. So we would like 1,000 people to have access to CLTB accommodations. So that would be a first step. And we don't just want to develop uh, housing units. We want them to be affordable. And therefore, the important criteria is to make sure that uh, the uh, the price of the housing never exceeds 30% of the household income. I told you that I would come back on this example here because there is a major takeaway from this project called the Calico. It is a multifaceted project. 34 uh, units were uh, created as well as renting uh, accommodation or uh, access to uh, ownership. We also can accommodate um, um, homeless people. We also have a group to have it at for feminist uh, uh, m activists and Brussels Logement has earmarked five million, euro, five million euros for a project and it is quite obvious that provided we are given the necessary means we can do a hell of a job. So this project shows that uh, with uh, substantial funding, CLTV can um, do a fantastic, a fantastic job. We have shown this graph that shows you the development of the social uh, agencies in Belgium, and you see that there was uh, the, 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 the line was almost flat for 10 years, and then suddenly the number of those uh, social agencies uh, went up sharply. So I hope that when uh, David comes back, we, we will have more than 600 agencies. We are also aware of the fact that the uh, public authorities' uh, funding is uh, limited. Uh, so we would like to have another model that is a rep that replicates the uh, CLT uh, model, but for private funders. It is called Fairground Brussels. So should you be interested, these people are in the room. We uh, also are inspired by examples from abroad. Uh, the Champlain Housing Trust remains a source of inspiration as much as uh, uh, the Committee uh, of Peña. These are uh, partnerships that are developed with the private sector that enables to create a, a social fabric and also to help people to uh, dream uh, bigger. And those uh, agents are important to uh, promote uh, better and more affordable housing. So I've just mentioned the different supports that uh, CLTB gets from Belgium and from abroad. CLT today uh, has a team of volunteers, but also board members that are highly skilled. And we can also reckon on a network of inhabitants. They are our best ambassadors. So we have more than 500 people who are convinced that uh, this model should be uh, replicated. 
For the city of Brussels, this uh, model is also a source of inspiration because every penny that is invested or every euro that is invested uh, has a, a, a trickling down effect. So we can grow as much as we can, provided we are given the necessary means, but we want to work on two legs. So we not only want to produce some more accommodation, but we want also to provide more support to the inhabitants. The floor is yours, Sophie. But David a déjà euh, montré tout à l'heure la photo euh, de quand mes collègues et anciens collègues ont visité le Champlain Housing Trust, Trust à Burlington, dans les États-Unis. C'était en 2008. Et donc, c'est depuis que Brenda Torpy, euh, qui est notre euh, intervenante suivante, euh, nous, nous soutient. Et Thibault l'a souligné aussi. Le CLT euh, de Burlington, qui est un des plus grands et un des plus anciens, il est là depuis des décennies déjà, et il tient toujours. Euh, donc, je voudrais bien inviter Brenda Torpy pour nous en dire un mot de plus. Merci, Sophie. Oh, ici, il faut tenir. Il faut tenir. Oui. OK. Thank you, everyone. And uh, it's just an honor today to, to be here for World CLT Day and to share in the wonderful things that CLT Brussels has to celebrate the award and the opening of a new development in 10 years. It's been amazing to see all the work that's been done here and beyond by you guys. Uh, so I'm going to... Uh, Describe us Champlain Housing Trust today and then give you a tiny bit of history about why and how we got there and a little bit about why and how we grew. Uh, we are a story of scale. And then uh, look at how we're funded, how our home ownership program works. I'll sample a few properties so you can see what our world is like and then end with the community because although we had to take community out of our name, we didn't take it out of our organization. And we've called ourselves Housing Trust to help people find us who need housing. So we are in the we are in the northwest of Vermont, up in the New England eastern U.S., right from Burlington up to the Canadian border. And while we started in one city of Burlington, now we serve a three-county area. But our mission states clearly: we're a community land trust supporting the people of northwestern Vermont and through permanently affordable housing. That will never change. We are a democratically structured organization. Our membership elects the board of directors, and you will see later, has actual governance rights that are usually reserved for boards of directors that are nonprofits. We have a classic board with three types of, of uh, members. Residents of our homes, which include renters now, co-ops, and homeowners, uh, and non-resident members. These are members of our service area who are not in our housing, and that brings that um, support from the community and accountability. And then public members who are members of our local governments and regional organizations. So our counties are uh, only Burlington is the only metro area in this in Vermont, and it's only a city of 50,000 people. Uh, and so our two counties to the north include very suburban and mostly rural, very rural markets. But we have always had high cost housing, and you can imagine now it's just gotten crazy. This is our headquarters in Burlington. You saw all your friends on the steps. So today we have uh, 3,100 homes in, of all kinds, and we'll talk about them. 650 of them are in home ownership, and we've been around for you know, four decades, so they have served 1,250 families with resale. We do commercial space primarily for nonprofits, but sometimes in the streetscape for retail that's necessary. We uh, do about 200 million annually in development, and uh, we have a $26 million operating budget, and that's mostly because we have 130 employees. We manage and maintain all our properties ourselves, so that's a big department. And since we have increased our work and services for people who've been homeless, 
We have a lot of social workers. That's been our latest uh, growth in services and community building to help people transition. We have about 300 million in assets. So most of our work is production and preservation of home ownership and multifamily housing of all kinds. Uh, and that's supported by a lot of you know, back office workers. This is the vision that carries us uh, in what we want to accomplish for our region. Our goal is to have a continuum of housing. And there's not enough of it, but we do have something at every level of need in housing from direct shelter to transitional and supportive housing, conventional rentals, zero equity co-ops, limited equity co-ops, conventional home ownership, and we do education, consumer education for people who can buy in the market if they have a little help. And each stage requires, of course, purpose-built properties and the right services. And those include financial education, social work, community building, and so on. So how do we get started? We were started because uh, community activists in Burlington who were really advocating their housing needs, tenants, neighborhood people, got a uh, progressive leader elected, Bernie Sanders, who's now our senator, and he inaugurated an administration that uh, wanted to bring the community, especially those who had been left out, into government. And so he created a community development office and his housing director, like everyone else who worked there, my job was to go out to the community, these folks, find out what they needed and wanted to do and support them to do it. We were not going to create government programs. We were going to support citizens to lead. That wasn't just in housing, but for health care, uh, child care, the arts, and so on. That was our model. And it was pretty effective. Uh, our community land trust was founded in 1984 after a little more than a year of volunteer work creating all the structures and governance and so on. There were very few trusts then, and so um, we were making a lot of it up, and we had to convince a lot of people. The city gave us startup money to operate and also capital financing so that we could go out and acquire properties in the market. There were two burning issues in housing, the risk of displacement of tenants in a target neighborhood of the old north end right near the city, suffering gentrification and speculative purchases. And it was um, uh, becoming impossible to buy a home in the city because, well, interest rates were also in double digits. So we had funds from uh, the city pension and local banks so we could go acquire quickly in the neighborhood. And initially we converted those properties to cooperatives, offered that to the residents, but many preferred to just be in rental. So this, uh, this method of the community land trust permanent, affordab got in permanent affordability got institutionalized in the city government because Bernie, as well as his successor on the right, Mayor Clavel, were committed to decommodified housing. The goal was that not a penny of city money would go into any kind of private housing, and they would only support permanently affordable housing. And over the years, uh, Ber uh, Mayor Clavel was mayor many years, he, we built up a series of policies and supports that have helped us to grow. So I noted that our method was to help people create their nonprofits and lead them, and the city supported. So in 1984, the city also created a big uh, uh, nonprofit to create and manage rental that's very affordable. And then uh, a mutual housing federation for the small co-ops that we're forming. And we all worked together very cooperatively, and we all had that same goal of permanent affordability. But the 90s became a time of constriction and difficulty in the sector due to federal government and state government. And so we started to merge in the organizations. That's when BCLT merged in the co-ops. And then we merged in Lake Champlain Housing. They had 750 rentals, so that was one of our big growth spurts. It doubled the homes we had and made us have to be much more thoughtful about uh, the rental side of the work. We also, in the 90s, we joined this national network that was funded by the federal government to help organizations, help people buy in the private market. But there were a lot of services for financial counseling and education. We wanted to bring that to our buyers. At this time, we had about 20 resales of homes a year, and so it was very helpful. Uh, you saw this. This really helped us expand our network. 
Funding started with city support, not just money, but policies of permanent affordability. We have an inclusionary zoning that requires developers to set aside affordable homes in each development. We get them discounted. Housing trust fund funded by the taxpayer of, uh, taxpayers of Burlington. And then the city drove every federal granted stuff towards our work. And then the state of Vermont, because they were undergoing a pretty uh, liberal uh, democratic uh, administration and legislature copied these policies from Burlington. So it was a statewide, it's a very small state, uh, all the federal money that comes to the state goes to permanent affordability. And then we built on that to raise money. So we use federal programs, we use bonding, uh, we raise money in capital campaigns. This is our latest one. Uh, and partner with everybody. So big, big uh, diversification of sources. And uh, we raise money sometimes in a campaign for buildings. And our latest one has been a $5 million campaign just to support the work of this time after COVID. And also to have a special program to eliminate uh, barriers to people of color who have been discriminated in the US from home ownership. And we're able to have special grants to help folks overcome that. Our program requires home buyer education and we serve people to the median income. And our formula lets people, I'll, I'll just do this, uh, earn everything they do in their mortgage, but only 25% of the profit. And we just go from appraisal to appraisal. If they do capital improvements, they get 100% of the value of those. So people are, can really invest in their homes. And at resale, we have an option, we purchase and then we sell it right to an eligible buyer. We always have a long list of people looking at these homes. And then uh, people also have to uh, comply with restrictions in the lease around maintenance and, and uh, refinance, but we have made that not just compliance, but also a way to give service. If we see someone can't maintain their home, we have programs to help them, we have counselors to help them. Today, uh, to summarize, our homes are about 50% of the price of a market home. So the subsidies have really grown over the decades. And our homes resell maybe faster than here. Seven and a half years is the average time of a homeowner. But that's true in the market across the US. That's not different. Uh, Two thirds of our buyers do move up to the market when they sell. Many buy another CLT home or rent. And then, our, as you can see, our subsidy has grown and we're serving people at a pretty low income in our market. This shows the variety of homes because of the different markets that we work in. I'll just go quickly through this, that we started with neighborhood revitalization and there was a lot of work to do in the Old North End, which we wanted to do without displacement. This was community-led development of parks and community fundraising. This is a community center where we raised money. This is where we the services for refugees are centered, but we've centered them with other programs. It's a great place of integration. This is a new co-op, uh, relatively new in our largest of 40 homes in the Old North End. So sometimes we were able to do new construction. That's another co-op. We took that revitalization to, into our downtown. This is right across from the city hall. And after a fire, we created good apartments out of an old slum building. And we did the same, and this is a very small village in the rural area, but they had this downtown from when the railroad was there, another fire. This is in St. Albans, also a rural city. That's across from City Hall. We replaced the slum with that. That's rental. And then we do green building. And then this is an example of inclusionary zoning. There will be, it's an old college on the waterfront. There's 900 homes ultimately in the build out. We're gonna have 25% of them permanently affordable. We built 70 apartments already, they're occupied and we're starting our first of two phases of condos. This is suburban, this is rural. And then uh, after the crash, we started serving the homeless and it was because we could finance and, cr and buy properties quickly where the shelter providers could not. We used to just work with them. And so uh, with COVID that really increased again and we started buying up the little hotels that were empty and creating very affordable small apartments. People get their own apartment right away, but also some uh, uh, shelter with services, for example, uh, victims of domestic violence and so on. And then on site, even if they're apartments, we have services and then people can move to our other properties and be integrated in mixed income communities. 
This is our shared equity program for racial equity, and this was built in a neighborhood that is primarily people of color. And then we can we also buy market properties still that are at risk of speculative purchase and displacement. And when we can, and I know you've done this here, where these folks are paying the same to own a home that we completely refurbished, that they rented for 25 years, and it's the same cost. So now they're owners, and they should be after 25 years of paying rent. And then we started a consulting arm. This is something we didn't expect to do that uh, is my work today. So I mentioned that we kept the community in, and our community has some important functions besides board service. They have to approve our bylaw changes, approve changes to that affordability formula. We have to go to the members for that. We have to go to the members to prove if we ever have to sell a piece of land, which you will sometimes. Um, and we bought a lot of little homes. And they have to approve a dissolution. So our annual meetings attended by 300 of our members before COVID. Uh, we'll see what happens now. And it's also a celebration. We also have an annual picnic for our members, well attended. And because we have a big region, we offer free transportation for people who aren't close to the site. But most of our community building now is done in each of the communities, big developments and neighborhoods, and everybody wants community gardens, and we add some every year. We even found a way to manage, people wanted to and they did, community gardening during COVID. We do community art projects that brings the neighborhood together. Of course, our members can serve on the board. Antoinette represents renters. And we have a special renter advisory committee. We survey renters and they drive the, the sort of services and programs at those sites. Of course, we communicate with our members and the public in every possible media. Our members are also very important advocates that have preserved these policy uh, moves that I mentioned, especially at the state. You know, when we have a Republican governor, every year we have to go and defend the funding that we use from the state and it's significant. And so we do you know, training and support for advocates. Uh, people take actions. And it is because there's an active membership. You, you know, you can win a victory in policy, but you can never count on that it will last forever. It's very important to sustain your gains, to build that. And that's why I believe in strong institutions for things like CLTs, so that all of our members know and can act. And then we celebrate, which you all know how to do really, really well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brenda. Na een van de grootste en de oudste CLT's in de Verenigde Staten gaan we nu naar Latijns-Amerika. Uh, ik nodig Mariolga Giulia Pacheco uit die ons gaat meenemen naar de Caño Martina Pena CLT in Puerto Rico, die enkele jaren na Burlington uh, ook de World Habitat Award won in 2015. Uh, Mariolga is a community social worker. She was a volunteer in the Caño Martina Pena for four years. And after that, since 2014, she joined she joined the staff as Community Engagement and Citizen Participation Director uh, in the CLT of Puerto Rico. Maria Olga, the floor is yours. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having us here. Uh, thank you to CLTB and to World Habitat for giving us the opportunity to share with the rest of the world. Uh, our experience and to learn from others. Uh, I think Paula is going to help us. We're going to do an, a new project here. It's new technology, so please put your seat belts on. Todos soñamos con una vida mejor. Usualmente, ese sueño empieza con una casa segura a la cual regresar. Para los más de 20.000 personas, que viven en las ocho comunidades que rodean el Caño Martín Peña, este es un sueño que inició hace más de 60 años y continúa en evolución. Durante la industrialización de Puerto Rico, miles de personas emigraron de toda la isla en busca de su promesa de progreso. Lamentablemente, en la ciudad no había espacio para los pobres, así que muchos se asentaron en esa tierra de nadie, habitada por mosquitos, 
los humedales y los mangles en el corazón de la ciudad que rodea el Caño Martín Peña. Para ellos, esta es la tierra prometida. Mi familia llegó aquí a la comunidad en, el, en marzo del 1962. Antes de eso, mis papás vivían en el Fanguito, en la calle República. Pasaron por un proceso de expropiación y fueron a vivir al residencial Lloren Torres. Ahí pues mi mamá queda embarazada de este servidor, pero mi mamá no se acostumbraba a vivir allí en el residencial Luis Lloren Torres, así que un día le dice a mi papá, yo no sé qué tú vas a hacer, pero yo no voy a seguir viviendo aquí, yo no puedo en este cajón estar metida, así que mira a ver qué tú haces. Para buena suerte quizás, oh, mi papá eh, jugaba a lotería, había sacado un premiecito en la loto y con ese dinero compró un ranchón de botellas que había aquí y poco a poco entonces fue construyendo la casa. Y es hasta el 1962 que entonces nos mudamos aquí a la comunidad de Las Monjas. Pero como resultado de la acción humana y de un modelo de desarrollo obsoleto, este canal estuarino quedó tapado y contaminado, ocasionando inundaciones severas. Sin embargo, las comunidades localizadas en los márgenes del caño no se quedaron de brazos cruzados. Se organizaron para atender sus problemas y exigir el dragado de este importante cuerpo de agua, tomando en consideración que ellos son parte esencial de este ecosistema. Un buen día se empieza a hablar de lo que es el dragado del caño Martín Peña y el miedo a desaparecer las comunidades una vez se drague el caño. Participó mi mamá en la creación del G8. Yo prácticamente entré cuando comenzaron a hablar del tema de la tenencia colectiva de la tierra y entendí que la, la fórmula mejor era el fideicomiso de la tierra. Así que a partir de ahí me involucré mucho más. Teníamos que buscar cómo mejorar la calidad de vida de los que vivimos aquí porque volvemos, sentarnos a esperar que las cosas se resuelvan no va a funcionar. Hace más de 17 años se inició un proceso de empoderamiento comunitario que dio nacimiento al G8 y que en el 2004 logró que se aprobara la Ley 489, que dio paso al Fideicomiso de la Tierra y a la Corporación Enlace del Caño Martín Peña. Se identificaron unas mil familias a ser realojadas por vivir cerca del caño o en zonas inundables. De estas, se han reubicado aproximadamente un 50%. Cuando estaba yo en mi tumor, vinieron estas personas a, a mirar la vivienda y a decirnos que estábamos dentro eh, del caño Martín Peña. En esa zona eh, iban a empezar lo que es el dragado del caño Martín Peña y necesitábamos irnos de ahí. Así que al principio yo tenía muchas dudas porque yo había escuchado cosas como que estas personas venían a desalojarnos y a quitarnos la tierra y a quitarnos las propiedades. Pero cuando empezamos a buscar otros lugares me di cuenta de cuán valioso era esto, de cuán importante iba a ser para mi familia, que es mi mamá y mi padrastro, y para mí. Todo fue bien amable y desde la participación y desde que nosotros elijamos dónde queríamos estar, si queríamos fuera o dentro del campo. Yo quería dentro eh, de lo que es el caño porque es lo que yo conozco, es mi hogar y yo sé lo valioso que es esta tierra. Vimos tres casas diferentes en diferentes espacios, pero cuando llegué a esta fue que yo sentí ese, pues, ese apego y ese amor desde que yo crucé la puerta. No se va a inundar porque ya en la otra se inundaba siempre. Todos los meses yo me enfermaba ya que yo padecía de asma. Digo, padezco, pero no es como antes porque yo desde que vine a esta casa me di cuenta eh, de la diferencia en mi salud. Así que una vivienda digna debe tener un techo seguro, un espacio para todas las los miembros de la familia por igual. A través de este proceso de democracia participativa, los residentes del Caño luchan por su derecho a permanecer en su tierra, convirtiéndose en los protagonistas de su propio desarrollo. Mediante el fideicomiso, la tierra le pertenece a la comunidad, solucionando el histórico problema de la falta de acceso legal a la tierra. Gracias a esta ley, cada residente es dueño de su vivienda y del derecho al uso y disfrute de la parcela donde su hogar se ubica. Al escoger el fideicomiso, en lugar de la titularidad individual del terreno, evitan la especulación y el clientelismo político. Cuando entramos en el proceso de realojo, eh, nos, nos dieron un derecho de superficie, leí esa escritura y habían partecitas en las que yo me tenía mis dudas, porque había una parte en la que decía que tú no le podías vender a una persona sin antes ir a donde el fideicomiso y que ellos evaluaran la tierra y ellos comprarte primero. Ahí nos explicaron lo que es el fideicomiso, que el fideicomiso es un derecho de superficie, ¿verdad? Pero la tierra es de todos. 
de todo lo que vivimos en el campo. He aprendido en que todos tenemos los mismos derechos, ¿verdad? Y también tenemos las mismas obligaciones con nuestra tierra. A 17 años de la puesta en marcha de este ambicioso plan de reestructuración social, ambiental y económico, son muchos los logros alcanzados, pero todavía quedan acciones por cumplir para poder hacer realidad una vida digna en armonía con el medio ambiente. Es fundamental el dragado del caño Martín Peña para así devolverle la salud a los cuerpos de agua que hacen única nuestra ciudad capital y restablecer el ecosistema para el disfrute de todos. Este proyecto de planificación ambiental va acompañado de una reestructuración de la infraestructura de las comunidades, permitiendo su acceso a los servicios básicos y respetando el derecho de estas familias a permanecer en las tierras que heredaron de sus ancestros. En el futuro del Caño Martín Peña y sus comunidades veo el dragado ya realizado con todo lo que conlleva el dragado, veo a sus comunidades más unidas, negocios locales. Hay mejoras de infraestructura, alcantarillados sanitarios y pluviales, hay plazas de agua, hay parques de pelota. Entonces eso yo creo que va a ser otro giro en la vida comunitaria. Me visualizo caminando un poquito, aunque sea con bastón o en sillita de ruedas, de esas motorizadas, porque hace tiempo yo creo que ya yo voy en esa. Y corriendo por el paseo tablado de la comunidad. La lucha no va a cesar cuando haya un dragado del caño. Va a comenzar. Porque estos terrenos van a valer mucho y nosotros somos los que lo debemos disfrutar. Yo nací aquí, mi mamá nació aquí, mis abuelos y bisabuelos vinieron al, al caño cuando no había nada. Así que yo, verdad, quiero disfrutarlo y quiero que mi gente lo disfrute. Para mí, tener una vida digna significa no preocuparte cuando yo beba, porque estás seguro que tu casa no se va a inundar. Saber que tu casa está segura, que no va a venir nadie a quererte quitar tu casa por simplemente donde tú vives. Tener una vida digna es saber que tus hijos y tú pueden ir a estudiar a donde ustedes quieran ir a estudiar. Una vida digna significa que puedes buscar empleo sin tener que cambiar tu dirección de física porque donde vas a buscar empleo no te van a coger porque vives en la barriada. Tener una vida digna para mí significa tener todos mis derechos, que se me validen todos mis derechos porque soy un ser humano y vivo en una barriada, pero sigo siendo un ser humano. Seamos parte del Puerto Rico que vive día a día en el caño. Ayudemos a construir la utopía. Thank you. Uh, this is a short video, you know, to kind of get you a sense of the project. It's a really complex project, but I, I want to be uh, the more clearly so to the audience so you can understand the, the big concept of the project. Uh, in our case, our CLT was created to prevent this uh, displacement and gentrification of eight communities uh, that are in the heart of San Juan, and you will see that. Uh, so for those who are wondering where is Puerto Rico? Yes, we exist. We, <laughs> we are an island, a Caribbean island in the uh, Latin America region, and we are a US territory colony. So uh, this is the strategic location of the Caño Martin Peña. As you can see, we're neighbors of the financial district, touristic zone, international airport, and the San Juan Bay port. Uh, so that gets a lot of pressure of speculation and possible gentrification to our communities. So this is a view of the Caño before it was occupied by the families that you heard in the video. Uh, you saw this picture from David's presentation. This was before Hurricane Maria. After Hurricane Maria, all, those do all that debris came into the canal, so it's completely clogged right now. This is a short view of our demographics. We are 11,075 uh, residents, but those are informal numbers. Why? Because 25% of our population is uh, immigrant population, so you know they don't answer the census. So, you know, it's kind, we know we're more than that. Most of our population are elderly people and we have a low education uh, level between the residents and also we have high unemployment rates. But also that's a tricky number because many of our residents, they work, they work a lot, even more than us in this room, but they are in the informal sectors. 
this is a quick view of how the history comes along. A, a brief timeline, in 2004, the law was passed. It was a two years uh, participatory planning process that took place. That was something new in our country. Uh, later on, we got the comprehensive de development plan approved. So that's what we are implementing right now. And later on, we were in a long, 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 long fight with the US Corps of Engineer to get the dredging of the canal going. I have good news. Back in January, we got uh, the allocation of the money for that project. Why we choose a community land trust? Well, in that planning process, people started asking uh, as you heard Sorimari in the video, how can we enjoy all of this redevelopment uh, that is coming to the area because we know we're gonna get, you know, like kicked out of the city. So they had a collective memory of displacements and they decided to look for options of how to prevent a future displacement of the communities. And that's when uh, some folks of the US uh, came down to Puerto Rico. We had exchanges like, like this, and the community leader says, hmm, there's an option that we didn't know. There's, there exists something that it's called CLT. So let's do that. And they decided to go with a CLT. And in the law that we approved, five minutes, I'm going, I'm going fast. <laughs> in, in, the, in the law that we got approved, they transferred us 200 acres of land for a total of uh, the, our special plan district is a total of 400 acres. So we have in community control 200 uh, acres, they have. So we have to question ourselves is we're, if we're taking the lands off the market or if we're creating a social market of the lands. So that's, I think that should be our mission. Uh, at the moment, we have 226 CLT members. Uh, we do surface rights deeds, and we have 141 at this moment, 33 temporary agreements. Later on, I could explain that. Uh, how the surface rights deeds uh, works, we recognize the property titles on the structure, and we recognize the collective property titles on the land. So you are co-owner of the land and you are individual owner of your structure. You could sell your structure, you could inherit it, and you it could be uh, mortgage. The key elements of our process, uh, we use planificatory, uh, participatory planning uh, process. Uh, we are three entities working together. The G8 is the grassroots uh, coalition of the communities. Fideicomiso de la Tierra is the land trust. and Proyecto Enlace is the public corporation. A really special part of our process is the advisory board and our partners and allies. We wouldn't be here if it wouldn't be for those. So for those who are sitting, there are allies, collaborators, partners, you are really important in these processes, <laughs> especially in the beginnings. Uh, we go outside, we do the meetings at the street, we constantly go to the community to validate to take back what we have done, to do new things. We take accountability really serious and we don't expect necessarily to people come to us to, you know, to receive our accountability. We go to the people. Our main strategy is popular education, so we use it in every intervention that we uh, do with the communities. Uh, we validate with them and we consult them every, every, every aspect. This was the amendment process of our general regulations and bylaws. We celebrate, as Brenda says, you have to celebrate big and small and medium achievements, because if not, you're gonna be, uh, no, 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 come on, let's celebrate. Like today, we're celebrating CLTB, a big applause for, for the team here. In the pandemic, we identified a really, really bad situation. We had a gap. Uh, between technology and our population. So we started a technology uh, educational program for our people, especially the elderly, as you can see there. And we do, we do constantly out community outreach and campaigns. Uh, this is an example of how we empower people and take back the power to the people because the CLT is the people. So you, you cannot be a board, a voting board. So if we have a vacant lot, it's not, big enough to make a house, we go to the people and say, hey, we have this vacant lot, what can we do? And people decide what they want to do in that space. As I was saying, we have different campaigns. Whenever it's necessary, we do social activism. This is a recent protest that we had to do after the last hurricane. And we have a lot, a lot of work with the youth and violence prevention programs because we are poor and marginalized communities, so we need to, you know, to have an eye on that. This is part of the youth group. 
We are prepared and resilient in terms of the hurricanes. We are in the pathway of the hurricanes, so we have to adapt the, to them. And we do, we do before job and after job when it's necessary. We have resilient centers to respond to the communities. And we do peer exchanges. This, is, this was a national peer exchange last year. We reunited five projects that they have, we all have uh, problems with the land tenure. We don't pretend them to become a CLT. We, we pretend to have the conversation on the table as a nation, what we need to do. Looking forward, uh, we're starting the development phase of our CLT. We're kind of backwards in terms of the history of other CLTs. So right now we're developing six homes in scattered sites. You might see the marks around the map. This is the total of the district. And we have three big lots that we are planning to multifamily projects and density. These are photos of the different houses that are being constructed. And thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marie Olga, for this quick and is inspiring uh, presentation. After Puerto Rico, we move further to Barcelona. Uh, since a few years, the city of Barcelona is putting up a really interesting housing policy. I would like to uh, invite Vanessa Valino to come and tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, Vanessa Valino, before she entered in the staff of the housing councillor of the city of Barcelona, she was the director of an NGO called Economical Social Rights Observatory. And since 2015, she's chief of the office of the housing councillor of the city of Barcelona. Vanessa, the floor is yours. Yes. So I... So hello, <laughs> I want uh, English, it's not my first language. I would do my best, but maybe I'm not so fast and so brilliant as the others. <laughs> I will try it. So uh, thank you for the invitation. Mm, I'm the f I, I believe I'm the only one who is coming from the government. I'm not from nowadays from a social organization. So this, uh, this presentation, it's, a, it's, do it's done inside the city council, for, for you to understand where I'm talking from, which is very important to, to follow the presentation. I put just uh, some slides about our situation, our housing situation in Barcelona, because the first and maybe it's uh, very important to highlight is these collaborative housing policies are not our main policies. We are living in a city with a lot of evictions, and without a public uh, rental housing stock. So our main priorities right now is avoid evictions and also to make this public rental housing to be uh, to grow. But also we do are working on this collaborative housing that we like it a lot, let's say. So this is just some figures for you to understand where I'm talking from. This is um, the country of Spain, and th that's the only amount of public housing stock that we have in Spain and also in Barcelona. That's the public uh, housing sto stock that we find out when we arrived to the city council government in 2015. Just 1% uh, of... Uh, rental dwellings uh, affordable for the low income people. Can you imagine this, no? Uh, it means in the case of Barcelona, 7,500 uh, public housing stock when you arrive to the city. And according to the European figures, which is 15% of housing stock uh, social to be more or less good, it means that only in Barcelona, only in Barcelona, we will need 90,000 housing stock, housing social homes. Do you understand? The lack of housing stock in Barcelona, 90,000. Let's see. Uh, why, the, why we arrived to that situation? Maybe it's, I, I don't really know a lot about this, Bel the Belgian situation, because it's, uh, I don't know it. But this is um, 
so the, the housing policies were not really a failure because they really try to make home ownership uh, a, a very important uh, regime. So we weren't, we were not a country where home ownership was so important in the last decades. It was a, a, a policy that was very exitosa, no? as you can see in the, in the figures. And it was also into the cooperative housing policy. So this um, policy, this, prom this policy to make everybody a homeowner was also inside the cooperative sector. It means that before, and before in Barcelona and nowadays in Spain, also the, the cooperative housing sector, they work through a home ownership. It means that the cooperative housing sector ask for public land that will become privatized and the builds, the buildings that they build, once they stop the construction, the people who goes to live to this cooperative, tra these traditional cooperatives, they became or they become uh, homeowners. So that was the point that they need to change because this dream about being a homeowner, it's it's really a problem. It makes it impossible for us as public administration to have public homes because all the public homes, finally, they become uh, private homes. It's very fast, but it's okay. So how we manage to, to try to, to change the, the, the mental, because it's also a mental problem if you want to be a homeowner. So the big effort was to try to agree into this uh, housing plan for the next years. This is like the main uh, housing council of the municipality. It, it just has like two meetings during, a year, during the year, twice a year. So the way to work was not, of course, through this very beautiful no, and, and impressive um, advisory council, but by this advisory cooperative housing group, and a specific housing group uh, w where we work together with the ethical financial uh, banks, where with the co traditional cooperatives, which are the ones who know how to build and how to manage in the financial sector, and with all these new uh, cooperatives who, uh, who wants to be who wants to, well, who wants to, for the collaborative or cooperative ownership, you would say. So this is the, the, the work that we, the place where we work in this housing group. How we manage to, no, in order to, to achieve the, the commitment of 500 cooperative, collective housing, uh, for the next 10 years. The first um, phase was this about we, these two pilot projects were, were coming through like, like by bilateral agreements, like the city council had this agreement with each of one pilot projects, but it was not a, a, a city council policy because a pilot project, it's not a policy, it's a pilot project. So when, when at the same time that we were working in these pilot projects, we started to work through this housing cooperative group, city council, cooperatives, uh, financial sector, uh, social movements, to build these public tenders. We had, in four years, two, two public tenders. Why only two? Because all these public tenders, the conditions were worked together. We don't have a national law about collective property, about another way of living. So in these working meetings, we need to agree these new cooperatives, the oldest cooperatives and the city council, who, how should be these uh, public tenders that consisted in we as municipality offer for free public land that will remain public for them to build the buildings. These two public tenders in four years with seven projects, 200 flats. I don't know if we were slow 
or, or not so slow, but it, it was impossible to go quicker because you need to negotiate everything with the sector because they got, with the pass of the time, pass of the time, um, they got very strong because of the public tender. Maybe after we can uh, talk. So, what was the problem? That these two public tenders, they obliged them to compete because they need to, to win. And this made a sector that was very used to work in a collaborative way to compete. This was not good for them. And also one problem was that with the public tender, even though there was a tribunal that we agree with the sector, uh, some of the cooperatives didn't, they were not comfortable with the decisions, so they took the, the results of the public tender to the judiciary. So we, need to, we, we needed to think for an, with an, to another mechanism to, do the, to solve the situation. That's why in 2020, we had this framework agreement that was also worked in this working group. And this agreement means that the, the sector is the one who has to decide which will be the winner. It's not now the municipality, which is always questionable, but the, the sector, the administration, gave, gave them the land, the public land, and the sector, through this framework, through their, their own mechanism, they have a lot of mechanisms, very collaborative and transparent, they should tell us to the municipality which will be the project that has sense to, to develop in each of the lands that we put in the, in the agreement. So this is the picture of the day that we signed the agreement. And these are the commitment. It's this agreement compromised the city council to, to provide land and buildings to arrive to 1,000. And nowadays, we are mm, by 600, because they are very like ambrientos. They, 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 they like it. it. It's a very, well, it's working very well. So some key elements about this policy that has been a constant. Of course, it, the, this, the, this unusual way to work for a municipality, at least in Barcelona, I don't know in, in here how do you work with the public administration, but it was not common way to work with inside the municipality in this collaborative bottom-up uh, process because um, civil servants, uh, grassroots movements, financial, ethical, but financial institutions, so very hard work, but also these moments, these happy moments, these celebration moments, because all the, the politics has been built uh, together. Key elements, just in, if something hasn't been clear, this structure like the it is important for us that the land always remains public more or less like the last example and so the cooperative the the cooperative is the owner of the building not the the users of the cooperatives so we, they don't have individual uh, property the pe the people just have the private use of the flats this is the and also the the homes they have this recognition and, this condi and the conditions, these legal conditions as affordable homes. And this city financial guarantee, it was necessary in order for them to, to get the financial help because banks, as they didn't know how to work with collective property, at the beginning, they were not in the mood. I don't know, they, they, they denied the, the possibility, no, the, the credit. Another uh, point, and, and this was because of the movement, because in 2015, at least in Barcelona, there not a mm, lot of people were talking about the, not, it's not like today that everybody is talking about climate crisis, but it was the movement who obliged us to, to, to do a model where 
this eco ecological sustainable construction should be a key and an issue of the program. So working together, it was not the municipality the only one who, 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 who imposed, but it was also them who show us how to how to do the things and nowadays they, they are very like they are getting a lot of uh, awards because of this policy of this uh, boot and all these new constructions uh, that were thought at that moment where was not so trendy as at least in Barcelona is right now I can explain you more things but I have no time Another thing uh, is as the people who will go there to live are the ones who design homes. They decide how do they want the, the buildings. All these buildings are very different. They, are, they prioritize the common, the life in common, the, the co-housing. They decide as we don't have a law to, that establishes how which percentage do they have the common spaces and the private flats? Every cooperative decides if they want very big common spaces like this one, or maybe there is a cooperative um, more popular because having this, uh, of these common space and spaces make that the flats become uh, expensive. So the more popular, less common spaces. Thank you. But they are the ones who need to, to, to define. And nowadays, this architecture, it's being awarded because it's different and because it's very, like, puts the, the, the life in the center and also a lo lot of things. So some clues about the new agreement. It, they are difficult clues to understand you, but one thing that, w that we need to, to improve from the, these public tenders, it was all this model was very modern, sustainable, uh, mm, co-housing and all these things, but it was not really affordable because all these mm, constructions were more expensive than the, the, the traditional ones. So in this agreement, we, we we ha they have achieved public subsidies in order to make the, the model more affordable because the last one, it's a middle class, not middle, not high middle class, but not able for the lower incomes of the city. So with these, uh, these two rental subsidies, we, at that moment, in 2020, now I will tell you what's going on now. In 2020, these two subsidies will make it possible uh, the model be very affordable. And also the access, we also guarantee access to, to the finance through public institutions, because of course in, in, the, in the sector it was not easy for them to go to the financial. They only wanted to go to ethical banks, but in Spain, we just have really a, a big one, just one financial institution, and they didn't want to go to the other financial institutions, which is normal. So as a municipality, we needed to, to, to achieve no, this uh, public money for them to, to make the, the constructions. These are the different projects for you to understand you know, the, the amount of, of buildings or communities that are nowadays in Barcelona in progress. It doesn't mean that all of them are already with people enjoying because we started in 2015. This, it, this means that these plots of lands are uh, nowadays belong to these cooperatives and they are starting to, to develop the projects. And uh, challenges, a lot of challenges. The first one, of course, is affordability, because when we uh, made this uh, framework agreement with these financial conditions, it was a con an economical situation very different from the, the one that we have now with this inflation, these uh, rates that are growing up, and our uh, financial agreement was related to Euribor 
and Euribor is getting crazy. So nowadays we need to find another financial agreement if we want this uh, cooperative, this collective cooperative housing to be really affordable and not become elitist projects, which is a, a danger that we need to, to, to avoid. Also is transparency. To become part of this uh, new way of life, uh, it's not easy, in, at least in Barcelona, in, in, in the popular neighbors where it's like anti-sistema, sharing things, not being an, the owner of your house. So that we need to, to make it more easy the approach for the normal people to these people, to the people who, who believes in all these things who, at least in our city, it's people with university studies, uh, postgrados, postdoctorales, we are, they are very, you know, with a, a mentality. But now, if we want the model to be um, really like um, enraizado, we need to be, that it becomes popular not only strong intellectually. And also this structural policy and not experiments. Now there is kind of like, it, some of them, they can be like a, a, a thematic park. If we don't make them real life, they are every day having a lot of uh, journalists, uh, people all around the world taking pictures. They are getting tired of this. And it's normal because they are living there. So we need to make it like a structural policy, not experiments, not pilot projects, not uh, a thematic park to, not in order to do the, the, the other policies. That's it. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for this inspiring overview. Na al deze inspirerende voorbeelden uit het buitenland keren we terug naar Brussel, waar een uiterst interessant initiatief zich voorbereidt, namelijk de Housing Deal. Thomas zal er straks een beetje meer over vertellen. Um, Thomas Dawans, qui est notre prochain intervenant, milite depuis des années uh, pour des logements accessibles à Bruxelles. Son implication dans les squats bruxellois, son passage dans le cabinet du secrétaire d'État d'Ulcoridis ses années fidèles comme collègue euh, au CLTB et maintenant son doctorat à la VUB ont clairement permis de faire avancer les questions de logement à Bruxelles. Thomas, à toi l'honneur euh, de clôturer cette session de présentation. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Thomas. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to suggest that we do this small transition with Barcelona that will be perfect because uh, on the basis of this experience, this uh, Calico project that was funded by the European project Urban Innovative Action, and for the first time it enables the CLTB to develop projects not to promote home ownership but to actually promote housing housing cooperatives and the development of these uh, housing cooperatives. So the starting point is the following. Can this become a new public paradigm for community-led social housing provision in order to support a new generation of uh, housing cooperatives or investors uh, and associations in the region? And I'm going to do that on the basis of the learnings and the lessons learned from this Calico project that we were able to analyze in full details. Now, I'm not going to give you a full presentation about the project. I'm going to tell you about the different layers of the organization of such a project to tell you about its governance. Uh, we have 34 affordable community housing in Forest, one of the communities in uh, Brussels. Now, we have uh, birth facilities and end-of-life facilities because we really wanted uh, birth and death to be integrated in the housing community and we wanted to include that in an intergenerational project. Part of the project is led 
by a non-profit making uh, organization, Angeladi, who uh, works to defend women. It's a feminist organization. We also have two housing first units to help homeless people. And uh, we also have um, CLT housing units that can be bought. Now, I'm not going to give you all the details, but this is an anti-speculation uh, program. We want to promote end of life and birth, gender, intergenerational approach, and uh, Calico means care and living community, so we really wanted uh, not to focus only on technical aspects and building. We wanted to have a public social policy to integrate different forms of living together based on the feminist concept of the invisible care. Reports have been published that are accessible here, so if you want to have more details, you can go to the website of Calico. Dot Brussels. Now, my objective here is to wonder whether this collaborative governance observed in the Calico project could become a new paradigm for a community-led production of affordable co-housing. So I'm going to tell you about the building blocks of the project, and then I'm going to tell you about the challenges related to the replication and the scaling up of such a project. So first, uh, we have to look at the market and housing to see whether it is a commercially rented or um, if it is uh, funded <coughs> on the fight against speculation. And then we have to look at uh, the um, ownership of the housing. Is it owner-occupied or is it a cooperative housing? And the purpose is to have highly autonomous housing units. So I believe Calico uh, is located in this ideal situation on this diagram. And this is the approach that we've had looking at this type of governance. So let's have a look at this lasagna. So first, the purpose is for CLT to receive public subsidies. So in the Brussels regions, we uh, receive uh, subsidies, but to uh, give access to home ownership in cooperation with cooperatives. So as a public cooperator, we receive land thanks to public subsidies. Then CLT organizes the consortium of partners who will really add this original note to the project. And they will also define the anti-speculative features um, to have collective owners, so housing cooperatives, foundations, or maybe other legal institutions, investors in a social housing unit um, who come from the private sector and who could become partners. So we go through a dismantlement and uh, different uh, contracts uh, with anti-speculative clauses. They can organize a special type of mutualist governance, which is different from the uh, public common framework of CLT. Then you have two different types of cooperatives and two uh, types of uh, functioning approach. One, you have cooperatives with residents. So you have uh, people who can invest money and own the cooperative, but of course they will be committed not to look for any interest and they will invest in this uh, anti-speculative approach. But they need to have money to invest in this. So we need to wonder whether these are not projects that are dedicated to an elite. So um, we also have a second type of cooperatives. And we had a fair ground. It was mentioned by Thibault. It brings together associations and other stakeholders looking at precariousness in housing. And uh, they uh, decided to create these uh, cooperatives in order to be able to uh, replicate these operations and create opportunities to provide housing to their target audience. Then. Um, the purpose is to provide social housing in the right social conditions with the right social prices. And in Brussels, we are quite lucky because we have uh, social real estate agencies 
And in a few words, these are agencies that receive money from the region. They are accredited by the region in order to actually uh, take uh, the uh, housing units belonging to private owners. They manage the um, renting process and they can provide that housing to low-income families. So simply to add this social dimension to private housing units with an agreement, of course, with the owners. And this enables us to reduce the cost of rent. And so these cooperatives and foundations will delegate their uh, housing units to these uh, social housing operators. Um, for the management of the uh, social rental units from an administrative and technical point of view. Now, if you have housing cooperatives who cannot offer social rents, then the cooperatives will uh, manage these housing units themselves as residents. Then there is another layer in this uh, lasagna. In this case, uh, it's not the housing cooperative or the foundation that allocates housing. And I know that this is very complex, but this is the specificity of the project. And this is how we were able to develop a community-based approach and to be anchored in the city because we have grassroots organizations, local associations. For the uh, Calico project, we have a nonprofit making association called Passage who offered the uh, birth and the end-of-life facilities, then we have this <coughs> feminist association, and these grassroots organizations um, respect the social conditions but use different allocation criteria. For example, they have volunteers in the uh, birth facility, and they also add the feminist dimension to the project. So this comes on top of traditional criteria used to allocate housing units. They really use the uh, community-based uh, criteria instead of having a general approach. And these associations sometimes manage and finance uh, services or part of these services. So that was the fourth layer. And then the fifth layer, there uh, you have people organizing the uh, co-housing uh, uh, and you can see this uh, trampoline with the ball, and it shows that associations are there to move away from an association-based governance to a residence-based governance uh, in order to talk about uh, different elements, not about the building, of course, but uh, making the most of living together. This is what we can call co-housing. And there is a willingness to provide support, collective support from the associations. So this is no longer the, the job of CLT. So it's a different function. You no longer have a community approach to promote home ownership. Cooperatives can work with other stakeholders to um, develop this uh, community housing. So at the level of residence, this is what I called the co-housing sociocratic governance. So they're using uh, intelligence, uh, collective intelligence, uh, residence associations and groups. And what is interesting for residents is that they can manage autonomously their day-to-day -day life. They are also members of the grassroots organizations. They are members of the housing cooperatives. And they are members, or at least they are represent represented in the uh, associations, the cooperatives, and the community land trust. So I believe that this is in line with the mindset of uh, CLT because they really want to involve residents in this management model. So this project enables this involvement so that we have a real uh, social project. So how can we reproduce Calico? Well, this would mean that we would contribute to a regional anti-speculative land policy. Uh, this would be supported by the community. And of course, it would be a socially mixed community-led housing project. It would boost the development of housing cooperatives in Brussels. Um, now, of course, um, you could use uh, cooperatives with residents, as I said, or cooperatives based on association, 
as I explained. And of course, the purpose would be to achieve permanent socialization of the housing. And then we would have ethical private funding, and that's easier to manage compared to individual credits. And it would really enable us to have a new management method for the uh, real estate based on a collective approach. Then you could also invest in uh, care services and uh, everything that is considered as added value for these uh, community housing. Now, of course, we're not starting from scratch. We had a pilot project. Now we want to move away from this pilot project and reach a structural policy. So first, we want to achieve the recognition of the different layers. And thanks to this project, we have different documents. We have the CLT. We have the subsidies of CLT. We have the leases, the cooperative statutes, the mandate for the management of the property. We have the allocation procedures. We have guidelines for community uh, management. So I think it is possible now quite fast to reproduce this and to follow these steps in a systematic way. Then we have developed links and relations with the public administration. And that's very interesting because this project shows that we can really develop these links and this cooperation with administration, the administration. Then how can we get out of this exceptional, outstanding pilot nature? of the project. Well, we believe it is important to develop a sustainable public, uh, public commons partnership in the housing production uh, with the CLT and cooperatives. And I believe that the CLT is in the best position to become that partner because CLT is recognized as a public operator. So I believe this can be the reflection of a public administration that is really focusing on this community approach and this need for a partnership. Uh, then they have a structural uh, public support. CLT is already operating in all the uh, city areas, so that is the right scale for the housing policy. And a CLTB is able to work as a network in uh, collaborative governance. This is part of its DNA. Uh, now, of course, CLT needs to be able to widen its scope of action. It needs the right management capacity for to move on to the next stage. And then if they want to be as ambitious as in Barcelona, maybe they would have to create other forms of governance on a tripartite level to include uh, financial institutions, for example. Now, what are the recommendations? Uh, we need to... Um, uh, fun, the scaling up and the mix um, dimension of the uh, projects. We need a plan to grow regional support to CLT. Uh, now the uh, we need to provide support to all the associate, uh, associations and partners. We also want to make sure we uh, can uh, collect private funding, uh, support the professionalization of cooperatives. And it's true that in Barcelona, they have this long tradition. We do have it in Brussels, but we have to include that in a consistent policy. We need to have support to the professionalization of the sector. Of course, there are also tax issues, urban planning issues that have to be solved. We need to reinforce the governance procedures and, for example, the working groups mentions uh, for Barcelona. And maybe we should establish a legal definition of a community-led housing project. And then finally, and this will be a transition to the workshops after the break uh, about the housing deal. What is the housing deal? Well, this is a project which is like the anti-chamber of a Carlico project scaling up in Brussels, in the region of Brussels. It is supported by a association, uh, a network, including 54 members from the private sector, from associations, from cooperatives. And this can be the uh, driving force for affordable housing in Brussels and they would like to uh, support uh, tripartite approaches with the uh, public, private and uh, cooperatives uh, stakeholders. 
Now, of course, this is only the beginning of this housing deal, and the purpose is to know how we can develop this new appro approach using CLT with cooperatives and other stakeholders. Now, a study was carried out. It was supported by the uh, State Secretary for Housing uh, Issues to see whether it would be sustainable and feasible. And uh, we thought that uh, providing grants to uh, CLT uh, and promoting these projects during 100 years, for example, would uh, create more housing units than in the traditional social sector. And it's also very interesting for investors. And of course, we need investments. Otherwise, cooperatives cannot work. And so it is possible to attract investors. Now, of course, we need to update that information because of the crisis. But normally, uh, you could cover up to 4%. Uh, so there is an appeal, an attractiveness. Um, so we are also studying two new pilot projects. That ve that's very important. And we're also trying to anticipate the conditions for a scaling up. So we hope that we'll have the support of the Secretary of State in order to fund the coordination, the setting up of this thematic working group that would enable us to um, go beyond the obstacles to uh, work with uh, cooperatives and other associations here in Brussels. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci, Thomas. Merci, Paula. Euh, bah, merci aux six intervenants. C'était vraiment, c'était très dense, mais très intéressant. On va prendre une petite pause pour décanter tout ça.